questions on macroeconomics that you may have up to this point on the subject uh, of macro. I had a question from the last class. Like, okay. Are there any checks for the government or for the banks while they're printing money so that they, they cannot exceed some amount? Uh, okay, so the, 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 the answer is no, at least not initially. If they want to print a billion, they can print a billion. If they want to print a trillion, they can print a trillion. So there are no checks to government printing, but if the government or commercial banks get to abuse the power of printing, the result is, let's kind of write it out. So number one, let's say abuse printing. In other words, excessive growth of money supply. Well, the next step is, of course, over time, not immediately, maybe within two years, maybe it can last as long as five years, you will get inflationary, inflationary expectations will begin to rise. As the government abuses more and more its power to print, and to extract an inflation tax, and as inflationary inflations rise, they get to rise sooner or later, again, with some lag, where demand for money, so demand for money, falls. Again, that's a logic we've done a few lectures ago. Now, demand for money falls, and suddenly uh, something weird happens. Uh, on the way to high inflation, in other words, demand for money falling is equivalent to high inflation. And here is the key, ultimately, which I am getting into. High inflation will hurt the government's budget deficit. Think of it this way. The government prints at 10% annually. But prices, by the definition of high inflation, rise even faster. So they rise at 15%. So what happens is government's got a certain budget, but the budget is losing value at 15%. So government prints at 10, but the loss of purchasing power, meaning prices rising at 15%, the corresponding loss of purchasing power devalues the government's own budget. So, the more it gets to print and the higher the inflation, meaning uh, accelerating prices, will actually result in devaluing the government's own budget. So, if they gotta spend a trillion, well, they suddenly lost 15%. It's kinda like they lost uh, 150 uh, million or billion, depending. So they will lose that purchasing power. So it turns out that the government itself becomes the victim of its own abuse. So the government would not like under any circumstances to get into the position of high inflation where its own losses will exceed the benefit. Now, remember the trick. Government prints a 10%. So it gains roughly a 10% that inflation tax. But if prices rise faster, the losses due to rising prices more than offset the benefits from the inflation tax. Of course, that's from a certain point on. So, the government itself being the loser, ultimately, down the road, right, will, will, will unwillingly have to decelerate the printing press. Is this answering the question? Is it good enough? All right, so, this should answer this question. Any other questions on macroeconomics? Okay, that was in, in, in the textbook. A discount loan would usually be associated with putting in some security. In other words, it will be, uh, the nature will be that of a secured loan. So, you have some security, like a government security or commercial bank, and the central bank will give you a discount loan 
but it will not give it for nothing. It will give it only on the security of some highly rated, currently it's called triple A rated security, usually government security or extremely highly rated corporate securities. You don't have very many of those in the world that will have AAA top quality rating, quite a few dozen uh, actually. So the outright loan will be essentially, hey, here is uh, a billion, take care of your problem. So at least my understanding is that there is no actual collateral. Again, security is the same as collateral. All right, so security, let's, let's, let, let's write out this word because it's got a few uh, meanings in economics and in finance. So security means like guarantee, guarantee as in insurance. It also has a different word that of Assurance. Now, security will also be meaning in the sense that I use it as a collateral. Now, let's explain the word collateral. Collateral in banking or in credit is an asset. It could be a watch, a government bond, a house, or anything else. So it is an asset, financial asset, real asset, any asset which is given as a security for the loan. So the security will mean that if the loan is not repaid according to the payment schedule or repayment schedule, that collateral will be seized by the lender and liquidated to satisfy the loan. One of the most uh, popular, one of the most popular examples of a collateral that everybody is familiar with is called a mortgage. And a mortgage is a collateral which is real estate. So a mortgage is real estate which is used as a collateral for a loan. So that's a mortgage. The loan itself is called a mortgage for short, but it's actually called a mortgage loan. All right? So far, is it, is it clear so far? And finally, security has a third meaning and security is standing short for financial security, which stands short for, again, financial instruments, which is the same as financial Asset, which is defined as an asset which is someone else's liability. An example of a security of this third type, one example is a stock, as in corporate stock. So stocks sometimes are known as shares is issued by a corporation and it is a liability, it's actually the equity of a corporation. So the stock that you own is an asset for you, but it represents the liability, meaning this is how the corporation financed itself through issuing equity. So stock share is also known as equity. So financial assets are used to finance a business, government, school, whatever entity it is. 
And the second type of most popular type of financial uh, instrument or asset or security are bonds. Are bonds. Now, I will not go any further into clarifying, just remind you if you would remember on the board where I had, if you'd remember, financial markets and then we had financial instruments and then financial institutions. All of these 12 or 13 instruments, financial instruments, are the same as, or they're just called for the short securities. Is, is this now answering the question in general? All right, more questions on macroeconomics? No? All right, uh, let's move on. Uh, today's is the last chapter on central banking. By its very nature, it is not quite that of central banking, but uh, we have to consider it in here. Well, it's got to enter somewhere. So the first is called the process of credit expansion. So remember, what I was explaining is so far the process of inflation. That was like five lectures ago. Now I'm going to be explaining the process of credit expansion. You had a question? Before the beginning, Ben, you were telling us last time you remember that we had uh, left that Fed funds. Oh, Fed funds. Okay, so uh, what was it on Fed funds? Sorry, guys. Let's, let's, let's try and write this out. Uh, Fed funds. So, Fed funds. Uh, represent a deposit of a commercial bank at the central bank which serves to satisfy minimum required reserves. So how does a commercial bank satisfy the reserves? Well, it either has the money, meaning the cash available, Usually it's called in the vault, so it's known as vault cash. So it either has a cash in the vault or alternatively it will have a deposit at the central bank. So these two are used to satisfy, satisfy minimum required reserves. So, Fed funds will have a market. Like anything else, you can trade Fed funds. So, now you'll have a Fed funds market. And the Fed funds market is simply a market where Fed funds are traded. Well, who would be trading Fed funds? Well, it's only those that have them and usually those that need them. So, another way of saying it, it is a, the market between commercial banks. And that thing between commercial banks, we call it interbank. So, we call it interbank market for Fed funds. What does it represent? Well, at any given day, one, two or more, maybe hundred, maybe thousand banks will have excess reserves. What is excess reserves? Excess reserves means Reserves which are above and beyond what is required at a minimum by the law. So, for example, you have uh, total deposits of one billion, and out of this one billion, by ten percent, ten percent requirement, you're going to have hundred million dollars. Minimum 
required reserves. Well, if the actual reserves are 1.4 R, the actual reserves, then what you will have is an excess reserve of 4 million. So $4 million represents excess. Well, remember, or you got to understand, excess reserves is usually cash or a deposit at the Fed fund. So cash provides no return if you just keep 100 in the drawer or in the vault, you get nothing. And Fed funds provide no return. In other words, if commercial bank keeps its money at the central bank, it gets no return for it, meaning it gets zero interest rate. So that four million of excess reserves actually is not earning anything for the commercial bank. If it is not earning anything for the commercial bank, well, the bank will try to make money out of it. In other words, it's going to try to earn. Well, how can it earn? Well, the simplest way is to lend it to another bank. And that other bank will borrow it, usually, because if that other bank has uh, insufficient reserves, insufficient is the amount that is that the commercial bank does not have to cover the minimum requirement. So if the bank actually had 98 million and the required is 100, the bank will be short by 2 million. So some banks will have excess reserves, other banks will have insufficient reserves. They will meet on that market, it's called the Fed funds market, and they will exchange those reserves for the price of an interest rate. And that interest rate is called, uh, let me see, Fed funds market will be charging the Fed funds uh, interest rate. So the Fed funds interest rate is the interest rate that commercial banks charge each other or pay to each other for borrowing Fed funds. Typically, the Fed funds are 99% of the time overnight. Overnight means that it is borrowed only for one day. Literally means borrowed today and returned back tomorrow. Okay, so that's what overnight means. So this is just for extremely short-term temporary deficiency of reserves. They usually do that. Well, the Fed funds interest rate will be targeted by the Fed. Well, what does it mean? It means that the Fed itself could also participate on that Fed funds market and the Fed could provide extra reserves or can withdraw extra reserves. So if the Fed uh, participates in the Fed fund market, it will or it could have the ability to affect the interest rate on that Fed funds market. Well, usually this is one of the instruments that the central bank is using to implement monetary policy. So one of the tools for the central bank is to set the interest rate on the Fed funds market. Well, how can it set it? Well, if the interest rate is higher, the Fed can supply reserves and it can supply as much as necessary. Technically, the Fed can supply an unlimited amount of reserves if it has to, as long as you know, in order to achieve its target interest rate. So this is called a target interest rate, or sometimes it is also one of the so-called policy interest rates. So a policy interest rate is an interest rate which the central bank targets 
and wants to achieve within some small bands, at least in the short term, in order to accomplish its longer term monetary policy goals. Is this uh, clear? Was that good enough for Fed funds? <laughs> should be more than enough. All right, so well, that I think should be uh, enough for Fed funds. So Fed funds is also what the central bank is using for monetary policy. All right, let's wipe this off and get back to what I was uh, supposed to do. And that is the process. process of credit expansion. All right, so suppose that the two of you guys asking for a penalty. All right, so well, so uh, first of all, suppose that the Fed in one way or another, we've discussed all the standard ways through which the Fed manages reserves, so we discussed them last time. So one way or another, the Fed injects uh, some extra reserves. So let's use the numbers from the textbook. So let's call it inject, inject 1,000 reserves. So for short, let's call it Fed. So suppose that's the beginning. The Fed injects somehow a thousand in reserves. Well, ultimately these reserves, of course, enter the banking system. And suppose that Bank A, Bank A, Bank A got the one thousand in reserves. Now, what's Bank A going to do? The answer is, remember, credit will expand by if reserve ratio is what? Is 10%. Uh, if reserve ratio is 10%, credit will ultimately expand by 10 times that amount. So it's going to expand by ultimately 10,000. But the key question is, how does it actually occur? Can now Bank A expand directly 10,000? The answer is no, Bank A cannot immediately expand, uh, expand credit by 10,000 because whoever gets that new credit may deposit it or spend it elsewhere and ultimately Bank A may be called to pay these uh, effectively uh, 10,000 and Bank A has got only extra 1,000. So, Bank A cannot expand ultimately uh, 10,000. Bank A can expand only a fraction of it. Well, how much? If the required reserves are 10%, it has to hold 10% of this and it can lend out the rest. So, out of 1,000, it can loan 900. I think it's supposed to be 910. All right, so suppose it loans 900, all right? So what's this 900 doing? Well, someone gets the loan and someone decides to spend it. Well, he buys a house, I don't know, he buys a machine, he pays to workers, whatever. The loan is withdrawn from bank, bank A. Somebody, the borrower, gets it and somehow spends it. And no matter what it spends it on or somehow it spends it, that 900 enters some other bank. Well, the other bank is simply called Bank B. So Bank B gets the 900. So it gets 900 in reserves. Well, that reserve, remember, is a deposit to it. So yeah. someone spent it and whoever got the money deposited Bank B. So if you have a deposit of 900, you gotta, withdraw, you gotta withhold 10% or 90, you gotta withhold as reserves. Well, if you withhold 90 as reserves, you could loan or, again, 
recycle the money back into the banking system, and you could loan, what is it? 810. So this guy, B, got the 900. It's got a whole 10. That's the requirement. Required reserves are 10. So it's got a whole 10. The rest, uh, uh, sorry, uh, from 900 is going to be 90. So it's got a whole 90. So 900 minus, ni minus 90 is 810. It reloans 810. Well, 810 is spent and then spent and then spent and then ultimately it enters back the banking system and whichever bank gets, gets that 810, we just call it Bank C. So, ultimately Bank C will get the 810 in reserves and same logic applies all over again. Uh, what's what's the 10% on 810? 81. 81. 81. So when we subtract 81 here, what happens to be the number? 729. 729. So low. 729. And now I will not insult your intelligence. We'll just write back D arrow dot 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 and then bank uh, E F G and then we have bank uh, Z Z whatever and we have this we have this and now we should do what a basic summation what was the ultimate credit that the banking system generated well, by injecting 1,000 in reserves, the first loan was like 900, right? The second loan was like 810. The third loan was like 729, right? How we call this? Hmm? <laughs> no, this is an example of the credit expansion. This series in mathematics and algebra, it, yes, it is a geometric series with a 0.9 multiplier, right? So it is less than one. So what is the sum total of this geometric series? Well, the sum total is going to be, if you start with 900, it's going to be 10 times that. Well, can anyone remember the formula? Yes. Is C over 1 minus, remember that, if it's uh, C1 plus C2 plus whatever equals uh, the sum equals C1. 1 minus Q. 1 minus Q, right. And in this case, Q is 0.9, is it? Yeah. So it will be uh, equal to 900 divided by Point one, so it will be equal to 9,000. Well, wait a minute. How come it's equal 9,000 when the originally injected reserves are 10,000 and we're supposed to get overall 10,000? Anybody? Yes, 1,000 is still held as required reserves. So, uh, when they inject uh, 1,000, uh, the overall is 10,000, but out of it, 9 is actual credit, and 1,000 is held as reserves to back up this credit. So, the idea here is that when the central bank injects reserves, the process cannot, is not simultaneous. They can't just inject 1,000 today and tomorrow morning the bank that gets it will immediately create five or 10,000 out of it. The idea here is that the process of credit expansion is a stepwise process. First bank A, then bank B, then bank C, then bank D, 
And the idea is that when the central bank manages or changes reserves, in other words, attempts to implement monetary policy, the ultimate result, meaning the ultimate credit expansion or credit contraction, will have to go through many banks and many times the original reserves will have to be reloaned to the point that it may take six months or a year, maybe 18 months. And in many cases, it may take as long as 24 months for an originally injected reserves to ultimately filter through the economy with the entire uh, credit expansion effect or money multiplier effect. So one thing to understand about monetary policy is that it is of course very powerful but acts with a substantial lag. If there's a problem today with the economy, the central bank can't just pump up today one billion or one trillion or whatever it thinks and see the effect tomorrow. Actually, at the earliest, you're going to get to see the effect maybe six, maybe nine months down the road. I mean, you got to understand, most of this stuff will be, not necessarily, but will be invested. So, when the central bank injects the loan, and for example, in our case, we're building construction. We gotta have the engineering, we gotta have the plan, we gotta have everything else. Then you get to hire the workers, you get to order the materials. In other words, by the time the uh, workers get paid and that money which they get paid is spent again in the economy, filters through the economy, it could take three, six, nine months. And this is only for the first original loan. Then, until you get to the second, third, fourth uh, effect, it could take easily 24 months. So, usually it is considered that the standard lag of monetary policy, a lot of econometric research is done, peaks around 12, 18 months. All right, is this fairly clear now? All right, so let's move on to the next and at least for today, the last uh, topic. And that is an, an al analysis of fiscal policy. I know, I have not forgotten, we haven't gotten to fiscal policy yet, but one major figure of fiscal policy, one major concept is that of government, government budget deficit. And government budget deficit is simply the amount of money which the government spends more than it receives from taxes and revenues. So, if, let, just an example, government revenues, of course they are from taxes, uh, let's say are one trillion dollars and government spending is 1.2 trillion dollars. So, you have deficit whenever spending is larger than revenues. So, in this particular case, the deficit is 0.2 trillion. Alright? So, we call this, we have two ways of calling this uh, deficit. One is government government deficit. The other way which is identical and synonymous and economists and journalists will use these interchangeably is simply called fiscal deficit. And still others wouldn't mind actually call it the government fiscal deficit. So these three are possible. All right, so next step in this discussion is very simple. Deficits 
must be financed. In other words, you're trying to spend more than what you're getting. So, deficits must be financed. So, how do we finance deficits? Well, what is the first most common way to finance a deficit, at least for ordinary people in businesses? No, that's the second most, which is the first most. Hmm? <laughs> no, no, it's simple. No, that's only the government. Can you print money? I want to be your friend if you can print money. <laughs> All right, number one is savings. First and foremost, the ultimate resource or source of financing a deficit is prior or former savings. This is what most of the people do in real life. And this is what many, although not all, of businesses do. They use prior savings. Well, what are the savings uh, for a corporation? I explained a couple of lectures ago. These are the difference between expenditures or uh, revenues and expenditures, which the business does not distribute in the form of dividends, but instead reinvests in the business itself. Well, for us, it is simply uh, the amount that we spend less than what we receive, and that difference we may put in uh, bank deposits, buy stocks, bonds, or whatever. Well, what about governments? Can governments use savings to finance themselves? Yes. yes, if only they had any savings at all. Turns out that in real life governments never have savings. Uh, at least the US government has never had in its entire history savings. It has always had debt. Our Bulgarian government of course is not that different. So it is inherent in the nature of governments that they constantly at all times indebted and they never have savings. So savings is possible but in real life it never happens for governments. So the second way to do is to borrow. The second way to do is to borrow. And the third way of course as suggested your classmate is to print. Alright, so these are the fundamental ways to finance the government. And the question that we're trying to answer, it is fairly simple, is whether government deficits, and especially sustained government deficits, are inflationary or not. This is one of the most interesting topics for the simple reason that the answers are shockingly simple. They are so phenomenally simple that as you get to know the answer, you say, well, how is it possible that economists would argue, and especially journalists will write all sorts of things? Well, it is a mystery. Well, one of the mysteries is that inflation is not well understood in modern days. What causes it in order to provide a straightforward analysis whether government deficits are inflationary? All right, so this one here, printing and spending, is a straight shot by all means. Printing and spending is certainly inflationary. inflationary. Next, the simplest thing actually before that is savings. If the government just spent its own savings, it is certainly non-inflationary. is in the course of financing it, no new money is created out of thin air. So now we got to consider borrowing, okay? And let's try to do this. I'll do this trick here. As there are a number of possibilities depending on who finances the government. So if the government borrows 
The answer depends on who lends it to the government. So, for a purely monetary analysis, there are three possibilities. There is a possibility that the borrowing is financed by households and corporations. So, households and corporations. How do households and corporations finance the government? Well, the government issues a security, probably a government bond, could be a treasury, and households and corporations can buy security with one and only one thing, prior savings. So, it is former savings which households and corporations have saved before which they use to borrow and this type of uh, government deficit, this type of financing the government deficit is certainly non-inflation. In other words, people do have existing money, their savings, they're in the bank or in stocks or whatever. However their savings are, they will convert them into cash, take the cash and give it to the government. So when the government runs the deficit, it's important to understand that someone has the cash, his balances are reduced by the amount that they give to the government. So, if I have 2,000 in cash and the government has zero, when the government borrows from me, I got a balance of zero and the government has a balance of 2,000. So, whatever the government gained in cash balances, me or another corporation lost it in cash balances. There has been no creation of new money in the process of borrowing by, from householding corporations. And therefore, it is strictly non-inflationary. Is that, is that part clear? Any questions so far? Any questions? All right, so number two, they can borrow from commercial banks. Well, typically the borrowing from commercial banks is involved with a new, fresh, credit given to the government. So, a different way of saying it is that banks provide credit to the government by creating credit, meaning by expanding credit. So, the source of this is credit expansion. In other words, commercial banks, by borrowing government securities, create fresh new loans and therefore deposits and expand the money supply, meaning expand credit. And no question, this is inflationary. All right, is that fairly clear? Now, there is one last way to finance which has very different consequences. And that last way is financing by the central bank. Well, how is it different that the central bank cre uh, uh, finances the government from commercial banks? They both create credit. They both create money out of nothing. What is the difference? Different that government supports central bank and central bank can print money. Central okay, so... They don't need to give back or something. Commercial banks cannot 
Okay, so, so? So, central bank can create money out of nothing. Well, that's true, but remember, when there is credit expansion, the meaning and the nature of credit expansion was the creation of money out of nothing by commercial banks. So, in this particular case, this is not a difference. Maybe the central bank can uh, support the money with Real reserve. Real reserve. <laughs> well, 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 well it's, or anybody? Yes. So, if you can print as much as you want, and you cannot give it back, I mean, just print it and that's it. No, that's not it. That's not it. All right. The answer is very okay. You want to try? Um, the the central bank may print money and give it to the people, and then extract the inflation tax. Uh, well, 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 the idea is that, uh, well, remember, central bank can extract the inflation tax any, any time it wants. It, it's That's why it's created. It directly to the government. All right, so here is, here is the answer. The first case, it was savings. The second case, it was credit expansion. But the way the central bank pays for it, and bank, central bank can pay in one, and only one way. Remember, it was with a liability for the central bank. Well, what was the liability of the central bank equivalent to? Hmm? No, 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 that's not it. It is equivalent to reserves. Reserves. Let's try this. So, anytime the central bank purchases an asset, any asset whatsoever, it increases its assets and it increases its liabilities. Well, the central bank's liabilities themselves are effectively reserves. Remember that, remember that we did it last time. So, if the central bank pays with reserves, it means that not only the government was financed directly with reserves, but now on top of these reserves, you're going to have an extra credit expansion. So now you're going to have a credit expansion which is multiple of the reserves. So if the government borrows, let, let, me, uh, let me write this out. If the government borrows from people one billion, the extra new money is one billion. If the government borrows from commercial banks, one billion, the increase in money supply is one billion dollars. But if the central bank finances the government, you get one billion dollars in reserves. But now that one billion will serve as the base to commercial banks to expand credit. So on top of these reserves, now commercial banks will expand over time an extra nine billion dollars. So if financing from savings is non-inflationary and financing by commercial banks is inflationary, then financing by the central banks is extremely inflationary as the government deficit now creates a multiple of, let's say, 10 times the actual uh, deficit. So this is extremely inflationary. and This is the worst possible case to finance the government. Well, we have a special name. I'm going to write it out with uh, black here. This is simply called, as I explained last time, monetization. So, one way to say is that the central bank monetized government debt, the central bank monetized the fiscal deficit, or the central or the debt was monetized. In either way, this is the worst of all worlds simply because it creates a multiple of the original monetized 
credit. You had a question? Yeah. Uh, in case the central bank does this mean that the central bank uh, like creates more reserves, like one billion more reserves, which is then used by commercial banks? Well, that's exactly the point. Okay. Is when the central bank uh, gives, buys the bonds, it provides to the government one billion in cash. Okay. Well, that one billion, the government will have to deposit in any commercial bank. Well, now that commercial bank getting an extra billion in reserves, the credit expansion process will begin in earnest until you get the full multiplier effect. Uh, then how does it differ from the central bank printing the money? Okay. The <laughs> because in the, this case, like the new billion of reserves is created and then... Okay, the answer is not different. The answer is not different. If the central bank sim simply printed the money, the government took the money, of course the assumption is with the deficit the government will spend it. When the government spends the money, it will again re-enter the banking system. Again, it will be redeposited by the banks and again it will serve as reserves. So in this particular case, again, printing it will turn out to be identical to monetization. There is a difference, however, and let me explain the difference. If, if the government, sorry, central bank just prints one billion and gives it to one billion, that is different from if the government borrowed uh, one billion and the central bank bought it. And the difference is that the government will have to pay back interest to the commercial banks and to the central bank. So, in either case the debt is monetized, but the taxpayer is worse off with the government bonds because the taxpayer will have to pay the interest on the government bonds. In other words, in the first case, the government got one billion free money, free meaning for nothing. But in the second case, it got one billion, but it had to n not only uh, uh, return the full money, but also pay interest on it. Again, this is at the expense of the taxpayer, so we're saying that both are bad, but the second case is definitely worse for the taxpayer or from the taxpayer point of view. You guys are ready to go? Yeah. Uh, I am done for today. Uh, let's see any or all questions that you uh, have. So, monetizing the debt, debt monetization, uh, government bond monetization. Okay, oh, well, let's, let's just met, uh, mention for a minute here something else. Uh, which is a major development in the U.S. banking system. I was explaining the credit crunch. Well, now the big discussion everywhere is that suddenly the U.S. banking system has such a phenomenal credit crunch that if the central bank provides the reserves to commercial banks, commercial banks don't want to spend it. So now everyone is clamoring and everyone wants that the central bank would monetize the mortgages, in other words, the really bad, crappy mortgages which commercial banks, investment banks and mortgage companies created and generated, now they're all desperate to get these sold directly to the central bank. In other words, the central bank to act as a buyer of last resort. Well, you got to imagine what does this mean? means now commercial banks, investment banks, everybody pressures hard the central bank to begin monetizing mortgages. Why would they want to do that? Well, because this will provide another inflationary, powerful inflationary stimulus for the banking system. That's number one. And number two, if the central bank monetized the uh, mortgages. This simply means that the central bank will take the risk for these, this, for these mortgages. In other words, commercial banks assume the risk and then they profit from it by selling uh, the mortgage to the central bank. And the central bank becomes the risk taker. Well, who effectively assumes the risk if the central bank is the risk taker?
In other words, they want to shift the risk to the central bank. Well, is there a risk to the central bank? Central bank can never go bankrupt. Central bank, whether it gets a million or zero, is no difference. Yes, it is all population. We call it the money holder. So everyone using the currency will effectively uh, assume the risk. Now, this has a special name. When you have a specific risk or a specific cost and you spread it throughout the whole population, how do we call this process in political science? It's called socialization. So now what they're asking is to socialize risk of real estate and socializing the risk of mortgages. So essentially they're saying let's stick it to the taxpayer and let's stick it effectively to the currency holder. So what they want to do is no longer bear the risk and no longer bear the losses but instead shift it to the central bank directly and indirectly to uh, you know, force anybody to pay for it with an inflation tax. So the losses in mortgages will be one for one compensated by inflation with an inflation tax. Is this now good enough for today? You ready to go home? All right, good enough for today.